Hello, everybody. Hello, welcome. Welcome to, oh, where's my paper? There's my paper. Okay, welcome to Brand Building Through Special Events on Working Farms. Um, today, uh, I'm Penny, I'll be moderating the session. Um, we also have, uh, we have everybody in the room and welcome also to our remote participants. We have people from all over the world tuning in to talk with us today and be part of the session. Uh, the session is being recorded and um, basically there we are. Uh, the, today our speakers are Pam Knights with Pam Knights Communications from uh, Vermont. Everybody's from Vermont. We have Eric Tadwo uh, from Tadwok. Uh, who is ED of Cedar Circle Farm and Education Center uh, in Vermont also. And we have Mike Isham of Isham Family Farm in Williston, Vermont. So here we are, Pam. Ah. Greetings. I'm Pam Knights, and I'm very happy to be part of this amazing international agritourism gathering. Welcome to Vermont. As a branding strategist and marketing specialist, I'm here to share my experience from an agritourism marketing perspective, to talk about how special events can be leveraged to build and elevate your brand over time, and to talk about the many benefits of hosting events on your working farms. Eric Tadlock, a farm educator, is the executive director of Cedar Circle Farm and Education Center, a nonprofit educational organic farm in the Upper Valley of Vermont. Eric will talk about educational agritourism and how the educational events and programs the farm offers has shaped the farm's brand over the past 20 years. Our third speaker is Mike Isham, a sugar maker, PR whiz, and the fifth generation owner of Isham Family Farm. He will talk about how the 3,000 foot square dairy barn he restored in 2010 has become a community center for the Champlain Valley. Mike will focus on recreational agritourism and the events they offer to include on-farm weddings, a multi-vendor farmer's market, and a performing arts series. He'll talk about how community building and public, public relations have helped build their brand. We'll each speak for 15 minutes with questions at the end of the workshop. Please write your questions down and we'll be happy to answer them. Yay, there we go. All right, food people, are you ready? This wonderful cartoon by my friend and colleague, the beloved New Yorker cartoonist and Vermont's second cartoon <coughs> laureate, Ed. Corin says it perfectly. Are you ready to learn about some of the many benefits of hosting special events on your farms? I'm here to talk about it from a brand building and marketing perspective. Let's get started. Special events are part of a larger marketing strategy to diversify farm income and grow your business. As suggested by this slide, brand building involves some heavy lifting. It's important to keep in mind, hosting special events needs to be part of a more comprehensive marketing strategy to increase revenue on farms. Building a business's brand is multi-layered it's a process that takes time and commitment. 
Special events of all shapes and sizes help increase your market share. The more innovative events are these days, the better, provided they remain authentic to the brand. Unique events and traditional events with a twist are more marketable and apt to draw larger crowds and garner media attention. Here, at Maple Hill Farm Barton, Vermont, a maple and Christmas tree farm, they partner with the Vermont Reindeer Farm to offer an annual holiday reindeer market day. Visitors flock to the farm to cut trees, select handcrafted wreaths, and purchase the farm's maple and honey products for gift giving. Just think of the social media attention this scenario brings to the farm as parents post photos of their kids with Blitzen, or maybe this is Cupid, across social media. It's priceless. Build your brand through special events to attract, engage, and help retain customers of all ages. Harvest events, such as you pick berries, apples, pumpkins, Christmas trees, Attract families and people of all ages to your farm. It's a perfect opportunity to engage them in other activities, such as tours, live music, horse or tractor drawn wagon rides, sleigh rides, tastings, and demonstrations. During Cedar Circle Farms Pumpkin Festival, pictured here, I remember them having a saxophonist playing amongst the pumpkins and a cornstalk palace for the kids to play in, and for the parents to take pictures of their kids for sharing on social media. Special events give regular customers a reason to return to the farm, bring their friends, and build a deeper relationship with the farm. Workshops educate others about farming practices, build connections, and help validate your expertise. Sharing practical knowledge through educational workshops helps to position you and your staff as authorities in your field. Partnering with like-minded organizations to organize and promote these type of events within the farming community helps to build relationships and broaden the farm's promotional network. In this slide, Will Allen, Cedar Circle Farm's founding manager, shares his extensive organic farming knowledge with some farmers just starting out. Festivals and on-farm performances entertain, educate, and build community. Harvest festivals draw locals and tourists to the farm. Educational entertainment in the form of puppeteers, storytellers, and interactive plays make learning about agriculture fun and interesting. Here, Gabriel Q entertains the crowd with a garden variety puppet show at Cedar Circle Farms Strawberry Festival. Many first time attendees will become future farm customers and even summer campers, which Eric will talk about more shortly. Your job at these events is to capture people's email addresses. Encourage them to follow you on social media and stay in touch with them regularly via e-campaigns, blog posts, and social media. Think about having people sign up for your e-list through product drawings throughout the event. On-farm event venues offer a multitude of ways to increase farm revenue and build community. For farms with the appropriate facilities, adequate staffing, and liability insurance, on-farm recreational events can be quite profitable. 
They range from on-farm weddings and receptions, celebrations and on-farm dinners, to farmers markets, concerts, and performing art series. This photo is of Mike Isham's spectacular event barn. An expert in large on-farm events, Mike will share some of his experience in diversifying his family farm into a thriving community center. Located just outside of Burlington, it's one of only a few working farms left in the area. Just yesterday, Mike and Helen hosted a mobile workshop on their farm. I may have met some of you on the bus. We think it's terribly important that you meet the people responsible for the food you're eating tonight. I love this cartoon by Ed Corrin. Back in 1996, when I was the director of public relations and special events for New England Culinary Institute, I worked to establish the Vermont Fresh Network. I've been active in the farm to table movement for a long time now, long before it became the thing to do. As a presenter in an earlier workshop said, agritourism provides an opportunity to learn how food progresses from the farm to the table. Special events help retain regular customers, encourage increased spending, and build brand loyalty. Special events offer an opportunity for regular customers to be part of life on the farm, to learn about and taste the wonderful food the farm and its partners produce. They often bring guests to these events who may well be your next customers, provided you engage them with a quality experience. This photo is of one of the first ever dinners in the field offered by Cedar Circle Farm over 20 years ago, featuring a local Italian chef. These dinners evolved into a popular series featuring guest food producers and chefs who shared their food knowledge and discussed the menu with guests. On-farm dinners require a lot of planning and preparation, but can be profitable as guests are willing to pay for these type of unique experiences, provided they are done well. On-farm cooking classes teach customers how to use farm products and promote purchasing them. Is your farm known for certain products? Cooking and baking classes show people how to use the products you grow, become comfortable with them, and want to purchase them more often. Hands-on workshops featuring gardening, cooking, and handcrafting have become popular. In addition to increasing product sales, classes bring in additional revenue and give the farm and its partners something to post about on social media and in their communications. Here, bakers learn how to make peach galettes at Scott Farm in southern Vermont, using fruits and berries grown on the farm. In addition to pie making, the farm also offers fruit tree pruning and hard cider workshops. Events increase farm sales on event day, attract new customers and drive future sales. You can expect a large increase in product sales on the day of your event, that's a given. It's important to be prepared with plenty of product and extra staffing. In this slide, the Scott Farm Market was a buzz during their annual heirloom apple day, after the apple talks and tastings. People come for the full experience and are ready to purchase products. 
especially those they've tasted and learned about. As mentioned earlier, capture email addresses, encourage people to follow you on social media and stay in touch with them beyond the event, start building customer relationships. Out of towners who attend these events are a target market for online sales going forward, provided you stay in touch with them. Events give you something to promote. They provide useful and effective content for customer communications and social media. A huge benefit of special events and programs is the content they provide for your web pages, for your blog posts, for social media, and customer communications before and after the event. Be sure to take quality photography and videography for use in promoting annual events. Great photography can go a very long way. Events provide opportunities for free publicity. With so many online and print opportunities available, you can easily list and promote upcoming on-farm events with posters, in online calendars, online community message boards, and in newspapers, magazines, radio, and TV. If your event includes free admission and or support for a charitable cause, you may qualify for free listings and public service announcements. All provide good exposure for your farm and help to build brand recognition. Quality photography greatly enhances the chance of getting into magazines. With the great photography we had to work with, I was able to get Cedar Circle Farm into several major publications at no charge for the listings for the example in this slide. Annual harvest festivals provide public relations opportunities and help build brand recognition. Cedar Circle Farms Pumpkin Festival began in 2002, the year I started doing marketing work for the farm. Just five years later, it became a 2007 Vermont Chamber of Commerce top 10 fall event. The application process was not an easy one, but it paid off. Cedar Circle was featured in multiple tourist publications. This exposure brought attention to the farm's name and helped to build brand recognition in major tourist areas beyond Vermont into New England and neighboring Canada. Seven years later, in 2015, the annual event led to a feature story in Image Magazine, pictured here as well as Vermont Magazine. And again, having access to great photography was a key. So yes, there's a lot of PR potential for special events on farms, but they do take a lot of strategic planning, development, and hard work to arrive at one that's gonna land you a big story. So to sum things up, some tips for building your farm's brand over time through special events, develop that strategic marketing plan that includes special events to help include, increase your farm revenue. Develop business collaborations for cross-marketing opportunities and to help build community connections. Take photos and videos. Make sure you have consent forms for purposes of liability. Do good. Incorporate a social mission and enhance PR opportunities. Help customers align with your purpose and feel good about supporting your farm through the organizations you support. Collect customer and visitors' emails. Stay in touch with them. Put a privacy policy on your website. Start promoting events online six to 12 months out to get into certain publications and to attract visitors who are making vacation plans. 
So how far is two pounds from here? After all the good farm fresh food we've been eating. Now what? Go out and weigh, get it, weigh, the many benefits of offering special events on your farm, on the farms you work with, and provided the farm has the capacity to properly and safely host events, they do a lot to build a farm's brand and grow customer loyalty. I wanna thank you all for sharing part of your conference experience with us. It was an honor and a pleasure to share my experience with you. I love the work I'm fortunate to get to do. And I have a great deal of respect for the work you all do as advocates for and stewards of the working landscape around the world. Thank you for joining us here in Vermont. Uh, I don't think I, there's one of the two of those pictures that I've ever seen before. Those are some, some archives. But, yeah. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Eric Padlock. I have the privilege of being the executive director at Cedar Circle. Um, I have been involved in, um, I've come, I come to this space as an educator. I, um, I was a classroom teacher for a little while, studied education in college. Um, and decided to get out of the classroom and, and go into uh, environmental education and agricultural education. Um, so I've had the privilege of working um, as education manager directors at several different farms um, on the East Coast, um, uh, Wolf's Neck Center in Freeport, Maine, and um, Fernbrook Farms in Bordentown, New Jersey, uh, a couple before I came to Cedar Circle. Um, so Cedar Circle, as Pam has, uh, has as described, has been a very uh, prosperous, thriving um, farm uh, down on the uh, the banks of the Connecticut River, just south of, or just north of White River Junction. So um, we have a really good, we have a great community, a really um, supportive community. There's a lot of farms in that area in the Upper Valley, uh, but despite the, <clears throat> or maybe because of the amount of incredible food that's grown in the Upper Valley, we just have a really strong customer base there. Um, so for 20 years, we've been running events, uh, festivals, um, education programs, uh, but we were operating as an LLC. So um, we decided uh, in 2018 that we needed to diversify the support for education programs. And so we decided to become a 501c3 or a nonprofit organization in 2020. Um, and so what that meant for us is that we needed to look at the way that we were engaging our customers uh, through the ways that we engage them on the farm, uh, the way that we engage them off the farm, um, and, um, and help them to become uh, a, to basically help, invite them to step up their support just a little bit more, become more than just customers. Um, so I'll back up just a little bit and tell you a little bit more about Cedar Circle and explain how we did that. So Cedar Circle is, um, it's a, about 40 acres of organic vegetable production, diversified vegetable production. Um, we have a farm stand on site and almost all of our sales are through the farm stand. We do a couple of farmer's markets. We do a small amount of um, wholesale accounts. Um, we have a, so we have the farm stand and then right up next to the farm stand is a little cafe uh, that just basically serves uh, right now window service espresso drinks. Um, and then we have a kitchen that is also a bakery. So the kitchen captures any food that isn't, um, isn't put out through any of our retail outlets. Uh, they do value-added krauts, uh, soup, sauces, things like that. And then again, they do a bakery. They, they, they put out a line of baked goods that's served through the cafe. So the cafe draws a lot of business, a lot of customers. We also have three retail greenhouses. So we have um, a lot of um, uh, bedding plants, annuals and perennials, hanging baskets, and then a lot of garden starts. Uh, we also have a good selection of perennials. So um, those are areas that really draw a lot of customers. People come, you know, especially in the spring, we're super busy with people just coming on a daily basis to get their, um, uh, I don't think my next slide, introduce. so it's a long introduction, but I'm trying to lay the groundwork here. So, everybody says, so, um, so we have uh, just a steady stream of customers and the farm is open seven days a week. So people can come to the cafe, the farm stand, the greenhouses seven days a week from May 1st 
until October 31st. And the, the farm is open, the whole farm is open to the public. The public can go pretty much anywhere they want. Obviously there's buildings that are uh, marked, but they can go down to the river, they can walk down the center roads. Um, they can just go out and see what's happening in the farm. If there's a garlic harvest or if there's potatoes being dug, they can go out and they can um, observe if they want. We also have um, a pick your own flower program. So we have a two acre uh, flower program. So people will hang out in the flowers, they'll get their coffee, they'll just sit and watch pollinators um, and just enjoy maybe the first day of school having just get, put their kids uh, on the bus. Um, so, um, so again, we've been doing this for about 20 years and we realized that a lot of, we were putting a lot of time and energy into uh, our education and research. And so we decided to establish a 501c3. Um, and um, we, let's see, bottom button? No, that's the pointer, okay. Um, so we, um, uh, we're, we're trying to transition our customers into um, engaged donors. Um, and that's, that's going to come as we see it. Um, if we can help build awareness with our customer base. So we are uh, an organic farm. We're trying to uh, move towards more regenerative uh, farming practices. Um, and we, <clears throat> we know that the only way that we're gonna make significant change in our food system is by using the customer base that we have, the, the, the people who are coming to our farm as um, by educating them, helping them, building awareness with them to help them be more conscious of the impacts of their food choices. And so that sounds like a heavy concept for kids that are hanging out and just looking to have fun on a, um, on a, a wagon ride. And so we're not really trying to get up on a soapbox and tell them about the doom and gloom of industrial farming and, and uh, um, not, not the doom and gloom of industrial farming, but the, the, the negative impacts that, that farming can have on the environment if it's not done uh, consciously. Um, we're trying to promote essentially our brand is our values. We're trying to promote the values that we have in organic farm. And that's appreciation for and uh, thoughtfulness around how our farming impacts the natural world, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to help them engage in the farming practices help and, and use the farm to and help them to understand basic concepts of ecology. Um, so uh, the um, uh, water cycle, the carbon cycle, um, the um, you know predator prey relationships, um, and so we do this through a lot of different programs. I'll get to the programs in just a minute, but we're trying to just essentially build relationships with these with these families, children through these programs to help them develop an appreciation because that appreciation really is sort of the foundation for uh, growing their values or, or building on their values that helps them to make conscientious consumers, right? Um, so through these programs, we're, we're engaging them or we're trying to make sure that they're always having fun. We're trying to make sure that it's not school, that it's not uh, front-loaded education, it's not front-loaded lessons, that they're learning through experiential opportunities. Um, they're making sure that those experiential opportunities are authentic, that they're real, that they're not just kind of made up experiences that just keep them busy. So uh, an example would be <clears throat> uh, going out and, um, uh, looking for uh, beneficial pollinators. You know, are we getting pollinators hitting our tomatoes? Are we getting pollinators um, in our flower field? Um, you know, where are the bees traveling to right now? Are they happy with the buckwheat right now? Is the buckwheat um, doing great? Or, you know, have they stayed away from the buckwheat? Um, and so, and then obviously engaging their senses, making sure that they're having an olfactory experiences. Um, and then this last part is, I think, what's most important. Um, you know, we all probably have some connection to farms. Uh, we probably all grew up with some connection to a farm, maybe a family farm, a farmer of a, a farm that belonged to a friend. As farms disappear across the country, fewer people have those experiences of spending you know, quality time on a farm, learning where their food comes from, learning how food grows. And so just giving them opportunity to spend time on the farm through these activities is, I think, in itself a sense, um, it gives them a sense of, of um, understanding of you know where their food comes in kind of gives them a tie back to their sort of agrarian roots that, that all of us have. Um, and what we want to do is help them help them to develop a sense of belonging that Cedar Circle belongs to them just as well, just as much as it belongs to any of us. Um, so we do this through um, summer camp. Uh, we have a nine-week summer camp, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
we have school programs very similar to uh, you know, uh, many other farms, our biggest programs are in the fall. So we do have a pumpkin, uh, a pumpkin program. And instead of, um, we, we try to make sure that when kids come to learn about, um, about pumpkins, we go through pumpkin life cycle, we go through uh, plant anatomy, um, we go through uh, um, the, the kind of season, the season cycle. Um, we do group tours. We have a homeschool science program. Um, our homeschool science program is a semester program. And we have uh, kids that come for six weeks at a time, and we have three sessions throughout the course of the season. And those three, those uh, six, sorry, those six semester, those those three programs uh, are um, three. There's three years of programs, and then they repeat. So we have nine essentially programs that we run through three years, and then they repeat. Um, oops. Uh, <clears throat> We have a little farmer's toddlers program, uh, and I'll go through that in just a little bit. Cooking classes, adult education, festivals, and a self-guided tour. So I'm going to skip over some of the things that Pam talked about, and we won't go through all of these, but we'll talk a little bit about um, so summer camp. So summer camp is the cornerstone of our education programs, and that really allows us to bring kids to the farm for an extended period of time, and it allows them to see the farm um, a lot more in depth than a, than a school field trip or a festival. They get to be a part of the farm. They get to be a part of the farm community. Um, and in so uh, they really understand the inner workings of the farm. They understand the, 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 the community or the organism that is their farm. Um, so for, for us, summer camp is a cornerstone of the revenue that helps us to support the rest of our education program. So the, the, the tuition that we uh, bring in from, from, at, from summer camp pays for a year round full time uh, education manager to run summer camp, but also to run all the rest of the programs through the, the course of the season. Um, so I think um, in the last three organizations that I've worked for, I've been able to find success with this model of running summer camp to build the, to, to generate that revenue to support that, that staff member. Um, the rest of these programs bring in uh, a, a good amount of income, but not enough, I think, to, um, uh, to support their time. They really need that summer camp revenue for us in our model. Um, uh, chores. One of the ways that we, you know, use camp as a as a way to build meaningful relationships is just to um, to give them meaningful work. Whether it's feeding chickens, whether it's um, planting, digging, harvesting, um, making sure that when they're when they're out there doing chores, that the the work that they're contributing is actually meaningful and not just busy and not making more work for other staff. Um, <clears throat> we, you know, try to make sure that the farmers, everybody on the farms. Uh, every, every person who's involved in the farm uh, has a pledge to con contribute to education programs at the farm, whether it's um, our farmers, our, uh, our cooks, um, or our, our chefs. Um, you know, everybody is sort of on board with making sure that we're working with the education team because everybody sees that this is a way that we're building, again, our, our co consumer base. We're building awareness with the people who come and support the farm. Um, school field trips. They're usually snapshots. They're usually only an hour or two. Um, we've been working with schools to build out full-day programs and uh, programs that um, uh, that kind of go out through the season. We don't do outreach, uh, and the reason is because there are a lot of other organizations that do outreach programs in our area, and we want to utilize the greatest resource that we have, which is our farm. Um, so we make sure that we try to do our best to bring uh, these kids to the farm, and we do that by offering, trying to offer the most cost-effective um, or the most reasonable uh, field trip prices that we can. Um, so just we have found, uh, I, I've seen a lot of farms take the approach of wanting to work with the teachers to help uh, build the programs with the teachers to meet the classroom needs of the teachers that they're currently working on. I have found over the last 20 years that teachers think that that's wonderful, but they're so busy that they really actually love to have it just a canned program a program that they can see, here's the description, here's the activities, this is what my kids, what your kids are gonna do. And they can come, they can, they can manage their, their students um, and let you be the teacher for the day. Um, and we found some, some great success with that. So we focus on soil science, pumpkin science, which is again, plant anatomy. Um, uh, and then, you know, uh, basic concepts of ecology on the farm. So again, just helping to make sure that the kids are having fun, that they're smiling, that they're engaged, and that it's not all front-loaded. They're learning through experiential education, through exploration, inquiry-based. 
Um, so community, community events give us an opportunity to showcase all the wonderful things that we do. Um, I'm gonna skip through some of these slides because um, Pam talked about it quite a bit. Um, so our little farmer toddler program, this is really kind of the, the, um, uh, the program that we have for the youngest kids. We ask that the kids are walking, but this is sort of a mommy and me or a caregiver and me program. So the program is every um, Tuesday and Thursday, and you don't have to commit to anything other than just one, because if any of you are parents, we know that everything is tentative when you're a parent. Um, and so it's always kind of a new group. There's always, there's some regulars that come in, people will come for a couple of weeks and go on and do other things and then come back. Um, but it's an opportunity for our staff to really be creative about uh, identifying what's happening around the farm and using that as a teachable moment, whether it's, you know, blossoming strawberries to, to learn about um, how, you know, blossoms for or, uh, uh, come before fruit um, or to learn about, uh, you know, the different parts of plants that we eat. So, um, there's it's ongoing and we always make sure that there's some element in the, the little farmers program that gives them an opportunity to taste test um, we want the kids to, to, to extend to expand their palate as early as possible um, so that's kind of one of the goals of that um i'm like really that's for me oh gosh okay <laughs> um so <laughs> homeschool science programs uh homeschooling is really like is, is large in vermont uh it's a big homeschool community um i kind of mentioned that we do uh we do three programs a year and then those three programs uh, or we do a uh, different three sets the next year and then do a different three set a different set of three programs the following year so that there's nine programs and what that does is allows us to keep our uh engaging those homeschoolers instead of just repeating the programs over and over we're building kind of a, a progression of programming that keeps those homeschool families engaged for three years um all right i'm going to just skip here and i'm just going to say um, i'm happy to to if anybody wants to reach out to me um, I can um, go back to my um, happy to answer more questions about finances because I think that that's often the biggest barrier is how does how do we manage education programs that uh, that require an experienced educator who should be well paid for their for their work. Um, but it can be done. It can be done well. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions about budgeting or program development um, if anybody wants to, to contact me uh, later um, offline. Um, so that was really quick 10 minutes. Thanks everybody for, um, for, uh, being here and coming to here. And I, again, definitely reach out to me if anybody would like to, um, to talk more about any of the work that we do. Um, lastly, I'll just put in a plug for the farm-based education network. Um, if you're looking to expand education programming on your farm, the farm-based education network is, uh, is that Vera? Hi Vera. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know you're back there. Um, so Vera is the coordinator of the Farm-Based Education Network, uh, and it's just an incredible wealth of resources to help people like us uh, to expand and build programming um, for people of all ages on their farms. So you can talk to Vera about it too. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I should do a quick through. Oh, you got to the beginning. Welcome. My name is Farmer Mike. I own the Isham Family Farm in Williston. I purchased, I'm the fifth generation owner of the farm. I purchased it from my father in 2005. I, I grew up milking cows on the farm. And uh, one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to become a full season for all four seasons at the farm. What I wanted to do is to have people have a reason to come to the farm year round. And I also did not want to have to have a lot of labor. I know how hard it is today to find people to work on a farm, people that are as dedicated as the owner is. So I planned everything that I did that you'll see in the slides so that one person could do this all. A lot of people would ask me, how many employees do you have on the farm? And I would always say, well, I have me, myself, and I. Me and myself get along pretty well, but I don't always see eye to eye. So I started out with, you know, maple sugaring in the spring. My dad had a small operation. I thought, okay, what am I going to do in the summer? So I, I did a lot of research and I came up with berry picking. People want to experience, you know, they want to come to a farm. They want to experience the farm. I meet a lot of people that are 60, 70, 80 years old. And their experiences with a farm or maybe at their uncle's farm or their grandfather's farm, but very few of them actually own the farm. I meet young people today and they, they don't have this link to a farm any longer. 
So what I wanted to do is after I, I started, well, I started doing berries and then I started doing pumpkins on the farm. And uh, I started doing, I was out picking pumpkins one time. Yep. Not that much. That was one. And I, uh, I noticed a young woman, she was very pregnant. She had a little toddler with her and she was rolling a pumpkin across the field in the rain. So I went up to her, I said, excuse me, can I help you with the pumpkin? She said, well, why don't you, you know, I just want to pick a pumpkin. I want to pick a pumpkin out of the field. And the light went off. And I thought, boy, people want to come to a farm. They want to pick a pumpkin. They don't want to, they bypass all these farms along the way to my farm. that have pumpkins that are clean, washed up on, a, you know, out in a field. But they wanted to actually go out into a field and break it off the vine and pick it. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do in the, in the winter time? I thought, well, I can sell Christmas trees. So I started growing Christmas trees. So after five years, I kind of built up this where I was going all the time. I had something every season. I had a short season between sugaring and berry seasons. So I actually went and I looked and found a, a, someone who owned a greenhouse and wanted to move to another location. So I actually rented a spot to, for a greenhouse on the farm. So I now had all these different little enterprises going on the farm. It was still one man operational. So then I had a barn on the, the old barn. It was over 200 years old and two thirds of the roof on one side was collapsing. It was unsafe to enter the barn anymore. I had timbers that were gone, timbers that had fallen in. So in 2010, I started an extensive renovation on this barn. And one thing I really wanted to do on the barn was I thought, okay, I have, a, I have an old Vermont farm here. Authenticity is very important to me. So I thought I'm gonna restore this barn, very authentic. I left the, the whitewash on the beams inside the barn. I tried to keep everything as authentic as I could. This is a picture of the front of the barn. You'll notice in a couple of locations there, like right here where the old door was, and then on the other end, there was a door. After I sighted the barn, I thought, what am I gonna do on those big open spaces? So I looked around, I found a local folk artist and I had her paint me murals. Uh, and on one of those openings, I had a mural painted that demonstrates everything that I do inside the barn. And on the other mural, I had what I do at the sugar house. My farm is separated by a road cut through half of the farm. One half of the farm is on the east side of the road. That's where this barn is located. And on the west side of the road is where my sugar house and my pumpkin fields, my berry patches and everything else is located. So I had the second mural to represent what I do up at the sugar house, all the agricultural activities. This was cool. Most of the wood on the farm that I used in the restoration was actually milled on the farm. On the left is a picture of the milling machine. So I actually cut the logs out of the woods myself. I'm an old thrifty Vermonter. I don't spend a dime on anything if I don't have to. I've learned that I can do so much of this all by myself. It's amazing what you can do by yourself. So when I start, I cut the logs. I had a friend come by with a milling machine. We milled up all the lumber for the barn restoration. On the, on the right right there is my dad, his older brother and my best friend. I built those doors. I wanted authentic doors on the barn. I looked at a lot of different barns. They all had sliding doors. I thought back in the old days, they didn't use sliding doors. They had blacksmith make hinges. So I went to a local blacksmith and I watched him build the first hinge. So my dad, his older brother and my best friend and myself, we hung four of those doors. Those doors are just over 12 feet tall and each door is over six feet wide. Every, everything has been an experience. Everything that we've done on this farm is, is very gratifying. I mean, I can't believe how gratified I was when I started do, doing the restoration on the barn. I can't believe how gratified I was when we first, I first started putting the boards on the barn. Every, every nail on the siding of that barn, I, I nailed every nail in. I put all the windows in. I did everything myself. I learned how to do a lot of it myself. The timber frame I hired out, but 
it's been a learning experience that you just can't be afraid to do something you've never done before. I mean, just look at everything with enthusiasm. It's fun. You know, everything we do is, it's, it's, it's a fun project. None of, none of this is work. You know, I'm, I'm busy 80 to 100 hours a week. I think I'm awake 100 hours a week. I usually spend that 100 hours a week working. I look at the choice of either, you know, I could go in the house and watch a soap opera in the afternoon or I could watch TV at night. Or I could do a project on the farm. What, what's, what, what, what do I find more gratifying? I find working on the farm a lot more gratifying. So I, I started trying to bring people to the farm. So I took an old manure spreader. And I built a chicken tractor. And I would, kids would come to the farm. I'd tell them it's a magic chicken tractor. It's got a seat. I put a horn on it and a steering wheel. And I, and I tell the kids it's a magic chicken tractor. At night, the chickens drive the tractor around the farm. Wherever the bugs are, the chickens go to it. And when I do field trips, the kids all line up to get on that wheel, turn that steering wheel and sit on that seat and honk the horn. And then, then for several years, I got baby calves from a neighboring farm and I put them in a pen. And I had so much fun. The chickens would run in and out of the calf pen. The calves would chase the chickens. I would feed the chickens corn. And the, I'd, use, I'd also feed the baby calves the corn. You can see how cute those little Jersey calves are. It just brought a lot of people to the farm. One year, a couple came by. They took a picture of me feeding the calves. And they submitted it. To, at the Champlain Valley Fair and they won a prize. And they were so proud of that. They came, they gave me that picture as a gift. Here, thank you for having the farm here. Thank you for doing what you do. We're gonna give you the picture that won a blue ribbon at the fair. And then I had a neighbor come by. And he uh, was at the fair and he saw that picture. So he wrapped it up in a gift. He came by and he said, hey, I found something at the fair. I wanna give it to you as a gift. So they were so proud that they won a prize and they sold a picture and I ended up with both of them. So I've got one in the house and one in the sugar house. So I started with events at the farm. I just started up at the sugar house. I put a picnic table up and I invited the public to have birthday parties at the sugar house. I said, come to the sugar house. The kids can pat the calves see the chickens, they can go through the corn maze and pick a pumpkin. I didn't charge anything for it. It was amazing. Every weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I'd have birthday parties at the farm. People would come to the farm. They'd want to do a birthday party. I did the same thing with the barn. When I started with the barn, I would do birthday parties for $100. I did barn mitzvahs. I did, <laughs> I did anniversary parties, birthday parties. I did them for a hundred dollars. Now next year I'm going to get eight thousand dollars for a wedding, and I we have a, a theater series that my wife has started. We started out inviting like uh, Ballet Vermont to the farm. They do, they do Ballet Vermont. Vermont Stage as a two week artist in residency program. We've had Lyric Theater, and then this year my wife started a Williston Community Theater. It was very successful. She had 12 hats as she did. She was doing a lot of the producing, the directing. She did the stage work with my help. I mean, we, we did it all pretty much single-handedly. Last night, she had a meeting for next year's Williston Community Theater. She had 12 notebooks. She had 12 different people working this next year. She's got a stage director. She's got, a, you know, she's gonna be the music director, but she's got producers. Now we're thinking, you know, we're working on starting our own theater company at the farm. We started with just allowing people to come to the farm and do theaters. And within a few years, we hope to have our own theater company. You know, everything we start with small, we do all the work ourselves. And we're just continuing to grow. We started pumpkin picking, wagon rides and a corn maze. It's the same thing. People, you know, there's a picture of a little girl out in the field picking a pumpkin. I just put a couple of wheelbarrows out there and I put a sign, wheelbarrow parking only. People love, people love the authenticity of coming to a Vermont farm. You know, use, you know, the, the humor that you can use of, of, 
to bring people to the farm. Christmas trees. I started selling Christmas trees finally. Peter, Peter Shumlin, he was the current governor at the time. If everyone remembers, Peter Shumlin had a home somewhere in southern Vermont and he had a bear going out onto his deck and getting into his bird feeder. So I said, okay, I'm going to take advantage of that. I took a piece of plywood, I dressed it up, and Peter Shumlin came with his state police security detail. He came with two news stations, came with several senators and state reps in the local area. And we put that out there and I told Peter, I heard you're an expert on bears. I got a problem with bears in my field. And he took one look at that and everybody loved it. It represented him getting locked out on his deck when, a, when he went out to scare a bear off his deck. And I used that that was the first time that I had the news there and I had all these state senators and people at the farm. And I said, okay, agritourism is important in Vermont. Vermont wants to encourage agritourism. So I spoke with my state senator, Ginny Lyons, and she submitted a bill at the Vermont legislator that year about agritourism liability protection for agritourism and farms that bring in people to the farm. And the first year it got shot down, the tr uh, trial lawyers, lobbyists, they were against it. So I kept working on it a couple of years later after doing political functions in the barn, former governor Howard Dean came by. He came by with some state reps and I talked to them about it and how it got shot down. So representative Aaron Brady from Williston submitted another bill in the house. I think it was two years ago that got passed. So one thing I've learned is that being a farmer, we also have the opportunity to make changes in the state, make changes in your agritourism laws. Vermont has passed several important legislation parts in the last few years, encouraging agritourism at farms. And we need to hold our legislators responsible for this. You know, talk to them, get their help in making it easier for what we do at the farm. The accessory on farm business got passed a couple of years ago, and that's something I followed very closely. One thing I learned is that when you're gonna start doing all these events at the farm, you're gonna start having, you know, you're gonna need help. Like when I started doing weddings on the farm, I spoke with my town officials first. I talk, talked with the zoning administrator. I talked with the town planner. I told them what I wanted to do. And, I've, and they've told me what I could do. I've, I've spent a lot of money and a lot of time getting all the permits necessary to do all this. And one thing the state has is there are noise levels that you have to go by and there's also times that you have to shut off the noise. And I've always followed all the rules. You know, if they tell me the farm has to be quiet after 10 p.m., 10 p.m., the noise is off. Everyone's exited the farm by 11 after doing a wedding. You know, I, it's important that we follow the rules that we're given and have good rapport with the town. And now when I go back to the town and we need to get another permit, we're able to get that permit because I've, I've, set, a, I've set a precedent that the farm will follow, you know, the necessary regulations that they put in place. So I'll be happy to answer any questions on any of this when this is all done, but Thank you all for being here today. And so it's all a learning experience. I'm still learning every day. So thank you very much. Thank you all. We have about five minutes for questions. Are there any questions in the house? Yes. I had put this in the chat, but I guess as long as we have time, um, I wanted to go back to our first speaker. Um, she mentioned something about a privacy policy and having that. Can you detail a little bit more what's included in that? It's now um, required and will certainly be uh, much more prominent in 2023. So I would really start to prepare yourselves in terms of having a privacy policy on your website, if you collect any sort of email addresses through your website or through your Facebook page or anything where you are taking 
private information. And what you can do is you can go online and you can get forms that you fill out, that you customize, and you check off various boxes for the EU, for California, for the states, and you pay a fee. Um, I got mine for a hundred bucks, you know, that kind of thing, but it's required and they are going to be doing a lot of regulation around this. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, they were all great presentations. Um, one thing I noticed during my camps, summer camps that I do with 4-H youth um, is uh, I bring kids to the, those farms that uh, does focus on agro-tourism. And uh, it is a different farm every year. I try to do different farms, just try. And one of them is that I noticed, maybe you can correct me on this, um, they can't be in the learning mood all the time because they need to do physical activities. And I have uh, noticed that some farms, um, they do have some physical activities for kids and kids really love it. It's like, I couldn't keep them like uh, picking blueberries, strawberries, like all the time or like attendance with adults but they need to like play with the corn. They got this called, you know, corn sack and they to do something. Like, I don't know what is your experience of running business programs. Maybe one of you can give me some, um, you know, input on these, like uh, what should we do to help those agro-tourism farmers to address this? Like, how do you feel? Uh, you need a microphone. Who wants to answer that? Uh, I'm going to ask a question. I'm not quite sure. Is, is, just so I'm clear, is the question how do you keep kids active during the day and engaged? Yeah, so. Um, so, so one of the things we do is we start our day actually with um, what we just call basic exploration and it's actually all camper focused. So we, we try to give them the tools or kind of explain, you know, how do we um, kind of almost through like Socratic, Socratic questioning, um, get the kids to really like promote their own inquiry and then they essentially go out to a certain area in the farm. It's a different area in the farm every day. And so they're really uh, the ones who are responsible for um, for promoting the exploration. So it's, okay, let's, let's, what are, let's, let's make, let's make some observations here. What are we seeing? You know, what do we think is going on here? And then just getting the kids to start coming up with questions and then starting to use that questioning to continue to, to ask more questions. So how do we answer those questions through, through exploration? And so that's really, you know, can camper driven exploration is one of the ways that we do that. And so the other way that we do, the other way that we kind of keep kids, um, I think, uh, engaged to, to, to create their own experiences we offer we don't run a canned uh schedule of event, of activities for the kids we have um uh we have groups that are that are put together by age but then when it comes time for and so they, in the morning they do chores with their age groups and they do the, that exploration with their age groups but then we go to activities and it's choice time so those kids are then given a choice of four or five different activities and the kids if they're six seven eight nine ten or eleven it doesn't matter what age they are, they can go to any of those activities. So then it's really sort of like a choose your own adventure for each camper. Each camper has their own experience, own camp experience with different activities. So their friend Joe might be, you know, and their classmate, same age, but they went to, you know, completely different activities. Um, so it really gives them an opportunity to, to, to explore their own, um, you know, their own, own interests. Yep. I'm very sorry, everybody. Our time is up. But we do invite you to come and talk with the uh, speakers some more. Thank you to all of you for sharing your experiences. And you can continue the conversation on our website on WOVA. And um, we appreciate you all being here. Thank you to our remote participants. We appreciate you all being here from all over the world. <laughs>